Hello and good day to you all, wherever you are. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the Society, but now as chair of the events committee, I try to keep all our events and activities going. It's great to have so many of you here tonight at such short notice. It's a fascinating talk we've got lined up. This is the British Interplanetary Society's 19th live streamed evening lecture since the start of the first lockdown in March of last year. As you may know, our next major event is in two weeks time, only, only two weeks time, I should say, on the 28th and 30th of June. And yes, it is the Reinventing Space Conference and it is going ahead as planned in the QE2 Conference Center, Westminster, despite the extension of lockdown. So I hope you've all got your ticket and are fully, fully marked up. I've got mine and I'm ready to go. So see you there. Anyway, we are, we are going ahead with the program and we will be one of the first, I think, conferences in London to come back after the lockdown because the conference center, the QE2 conference center rooms are so large that they're able to accommodate most of our delegates with full social distancing. And for the others, the whole event will be available online. Today, we are again using Crowdcast for both the presentation and the Q&A, so most of you are already familiar with it. Please use the chat box for your networking and the questions box for your questions. As you know, you can vote up the questions you want to go to the top, so get them in quick so that more people can get the chance to vote. If you enjoy this evening and want to make a small donation, please click on the donate button at the bottom of the page. Every little helps to cover the cost of these lectures. I'm extremely pleased to say that Stuart Eves, as a fellow of the Society, stepped in at the last minute to fill the gap in our lecture program. Tonight, he is going to both ask and, I hope, answer the question, is there enough space in space? Which is extremely topical at the moment, as I believe it may even have been asked at the recent G7 meeting in Cornwall. Those that have read his abstract will know that this will be an extremely wide ranging talk. I'll be interested to see where OneWeb and Stonehenge fit in and saving the planet sounds pretty impressive. As you will also see Stuart's in Stuart's bio, he's a man of many parts, or I should say many roles and experiences. From his early days, well, 16 years, in the MOD as a user operator of Skynet communication satellites, he moved on to SSTL as lead mission concepts engineer, where he initiated the new TopSat imaging satellite program. He was also instrumental in getting school projects flown on Tech DemoSat, and we know him even better as the chair of our education and outreach committee for many years. He's also been the leader of our Space A-Level study project, which we hope may still come to fruition. Anyway, enough of my waffle. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Alistair. I'm going to see whether the um, I can live up to your hype by um, making this work. <clears throat> So can you confirm that you can see my slides full screen? Yes, I can. Super, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so the question that I decided to try and tackle uh, this evening is, is there enough space in space? Uh, there has been a lot of discussion uh, recently about the impending uh, collision, perhaps, between the astronomy community and the space commerce uh, community um, about use of space and uh, access to dark skies and uninterrupted views of the heavens. So I'm going to touch on that subject uh, to begin with, but as you may have gathered from the abstract, um, I'm going to um, move on from there to um, rather larger scale topics and rather longer term projects and uh, hope to convince you that I do think there's enough space in space, uh, but it does require that the astronomers and the satellite manufacturers um, 
uh, make peace and collaborate rather than uh, ending up at each other's throats, which would be a bad situation, I think. So um, to kick off, um, I thought I would uh, start with uh, the hot topics in satellite design. And as you're probably well aware, uh, the topic of mega constellations is the thing that's dominating satellite manufacturing at the moment. Historically, satellites were large and produced in small numbers because they were large and expensive and cost a lot to launch. Uh, more recently, we've seen um, a significant shift from the sort of government sector into the commercial sector. A very large proportion of what's getting launched these days uh, is put up by commercial companies. And it's some of these launches that have been starting to create concern. The image in the top right is one taken shortly after one of the Starlink launches, which deployed around 60 satellites into low Earth orbit. And as they started to separate, they created a chain, uh, which is what you can see in the illustration. And Starlink are by no means alone. There are lots of other planned mega constellations. Um, if you were one of the people that joined the Losing the Sky debate that was hosted by the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh last night, you'll know that some estimates put the total population of low Earth orbit constellations at over 100,000 satellites within the next decade or so, which when you compare it with what was historically a number around 1,000 and which has increased recently to around 3,000, you can see that 100,000 is a very large number indeed. So, a question that you might be asking yourself is, why do these not new constellations require so many satellites? So perhaps we can address that particular issue first of all. It might seem slightly counterintuitive in the sense that, as this uh, illustration shows, a satellite in low Earth orbit has a smaller uh, footprint on the surface of the Earth than one in a higher orbit, such as medium Earth orbit. So you might think that uh, constellation designers would go to higher altitudes in order to reduce the number of satellites they need. Um, so why are they going to low Earth orbit if it requires a lot more satellites to achieve the coverage that they want? So the answers to that question include um, trying to get higher signal strengths and by extension higher data rates the desire to get higher elevation angles and the desire to reduce the latency of the communications between one place on the Earth and another. But it might still seem a little puzzling because a constellation that achieved global coverage uh, called Iridium was launched uh, initially in the 1990s. And as the name of the constellation sort of uh, was derived from the periodic table, they had 66 active satellites and 11 spares, so a total of 77 satellites in orbit um, at an altitude of 780 kilometers. It therefore seems a bit counterintuitive that OneWeb are going to require nearly um, an order of magnitude more satellites, uh, 648 is at least one of their um, published numbers, at an altitude that's considerably higher, 1,200 kilometers. So what is going on? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, they're aiming at is higher data rates. So Iridium uh, is a system designed to do voice communications and even the new generation of Iridium satellites called Iridium Next um, uh, only achieves data rates of around 1400 kilobits per second, and that's using one of the more advanced Iridium terminals. By comparison, what uh, the um, mega constellations that we're talking about, OneWeb and SpaceX and, and some of the others, um, like the Kuiper um, constellation from Amazon, uh, they're looking at data rates in gigabits per second. And uh, the aim that they have is to provide uh, streaming uh, video uh, and internet connectivity around the globe. And uh, to achieve that effectively, they want much, much higher data rates than a system like Iridium. Another issue is the desire to keep 
uh, satellites are closer to the zenith uh, position of the user, so higher elevation angles. And um, these uh, are deliberately designed to uh, allow the satellites to, if you like, concentrate their energy uh, on a smaller coverage footprint below the satellite. And uh, that's done quite deliberately. Um, in part, it's because uh, they anticipate providing uh, communications to urban areas. So there are a couple of issues associated with urban areas. One is that uh, they have what are so-called uh, urban canyons, where tall buildings can limit your view of the sky. So it certainly helps to have satellites at high elevation angles. But the other issue, which is a sort of uh, driving constraint on the uh, the design, is that uh, in an urban area, what the mega constellation operators hope is that they will have very many um, op uh, subscribers trying to access their satellites. And their concern is that if they made their footprints too large, that they would end up with too many subscribers trying to access through a single satellite and their data rates would start to suffer. Um, so the relatively small footprints are quite deliberate. Uh, they are to try and make sure that the data rates uh, through any given satellite remain within a sort of reasonable bound. But the really key issue, I believe, um, and it has led to um, changes, I think, to some of the planned designs that have been published by the mega constellation operators, is the issue of reduced latency. So. Latency isn't a parameter that's been talked about a great deal in satellite communications historically. Um, but the issue is that satellites in low Earth orbit can pass information from uh, between two financial centers. For example, let's take London and New York as an example, um, even faster than the subsea cables. Now, if you've ever sort of taken an interest in um, the financial sector and how much money you can make by conducting your financial trade operations slightly quicker than your opposition. You'll know that even uh, fractions of a second, even milliseconds, actually allow you to make lots and lots of money. So the fact that the very low um, mega constellations like Kuiper and um, Starlink can actually achieve that is a major source of potential revenue generation for them. And uh, I think that's one of the particular reasons why Starlink chose to modify its orbital parameters. Uh, when it started out, Starlink was potentially going to compete with um, the OneWeb constellation for um, orbital territory around 1,200 kilometers altitude, and then at the very last minute, um, Starlink chose to um, refile with the, the US regulators for much lower altitude orbits. And I think it's entirely this latency issue that drove them to do so. Now, in order to explain um, some of the issues a little later on, I do want to talk about a couple of uh, other factors associated with the constellation designs. So one of them is the choice of orbital inclination. So unlike some of their competitors, OneWeb have chosen to go for an orbital inclination that's close to polar. It's uh, around 88 degrees. So their coverage pattern spends a lot of time over high latitudes where, frankly, there are very few paying customers. There are a few that obviously would cherish um, having adequate communications, uh, people in high northern latitude places in uh, countries like Canada um, would see that as an advantage. But uh, if you look at a map of where people on the Earth are actually living, um, you don't need to go anywhere near the poles to cover the vast majority of the potential users of the system. Starlink have noticed this, and their chosen orbital inclination is only 53 degrees. Um, as a result, their satellites spend the vast majority of their time over the sorts of latitudes where people live. Um, clearly, as a result of orbital dynamics, they're going to spend time uh, over the oceans, where clearly a lot of people don't live. 
Um, but when they are over land, they're almost certainly going to be overpopulated land. And uh, that means that their satellites will be have revenue generating capability for a larger proportion of their time. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, is that Starlink have made a significant change to um, their choice of orbital altitude. They're now down at around 550 kilometers uh, altitude adjacent to the Kuiper constellation. And if you've been following the space press, um, Kuiper originally chose to go to a low altitude like this and then were somewhat um, disenchanted when uh, Starlink revised their orbital altitude plan um, to join them at this low altitude. And I think what they're realizing is that it is actually this um, uh, ability to provide low latency communications via low altitude satellites within satellite links um, that is a driving factor. And I think um, the Kuiper uh, designers thought that they had stolen a march on the competition and then were disappointed to find that um, their secret, if it was a secret, um, had been spotted by Starlink 2. It's probably also worth recognizing that it's not just the mega constellations that are potentially going to cause a problem for the astronomy community. Um, the debris population in Earth orbit is already very large. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the means to actually measure it all that accurately. Uh, we can measure down to about 10 centimeter sized objects but uh, um, we care about an order of magnitude less than that. We care about objects as small as one centimeter in size. The reason being that even a, a very small object like that, um, traveling at a low Earth orbit velocity of seven and a half kilometers a second, has enough kinetic energy to uh, completely destroy a satellite. It has the equivalent energy of a hand grenade. So we have estimates of how big that population of low Earth orbit objects is. Um, the NASA estimate of that population above one centimeter size is 500,000 objects. The European Space Agency's estimate of the same number is 900,000 objects. So you can see there's nearly a factor of dif two difference between these two estimates. So clearly we need much better surveillance of space in order to actually determine the actual numbers because those actual numbers will drive um, the debris evolution that's illustrated in the plot on the right hand side of this chart. So we are confident that even if we do a lot of post-mission disposal, which is the acronym PMD on this uh, uh, illustration, that uh, the debris population will increase inevitably. And that's because um, there is already debris in orbit and the laws of orbital dynamics and statistics says that eventually those objects will collide one with one another and create additional debris. But if we do clean up our act, we can at least hope that the debris population will increase slowly. Um, if we don't clean up our act, uh, we'll end up on one of the red or orange curves and the debris population will get out of hand and our ability to use um, the orbital regimes around Earth will become severely restricted. You may notice that on all of these um, plots of the future debris population, there's a slight ripple. Um, <clears throat> that ripple has a period of 11 years. And the reason that it has uh, a ripple of 11 years is because it's related to the solar activity cycle. So what happens when the sun is most active is that the Earth's atmosphere expands, um, heated by the additional ultraviolet and X-ray radiation that's arriving at the Earth when the sun's at a maximum. And that increases the drag on the satellites and causes some of them to re-enter. We're not entirely clear that the sun will continue to um, behave itself. There have been periods such as the Maunder Minimum uh, in the past where very few sunspots were observed over a period of about 70 years. 
And if that does correspond to um, a reduction in the activity of the sun and the uh, reduction in the drag on satellites as a consequence, uh, then we could see the um, debris population expanding even faster than we imagine, which would obviously be very bad. So these are two possible future scenarios, one in which we clean up our act and implement space debris mitigation, and one that uh, results if we just carry on as we are at the moment. And as you can see, although the um, representations of the satellites on these diagrams are clearly massively out of scale, um, the debris population becomes um, pretty unattractive in about uh, 100 years' time. So um, if we want to avoid this sort of scenario, we're definitely going to have to do better. Let's move now to uh, consider the other side of the um, equation, which is the hot topics in astronomy. So um, the astronomical community is changing the sorts of things that they do just as much as the satellite construction community is changing the way that they operate. The way that uh, astronomy is changing is that rather than building ever larger telescopes simply with the idea of looking further and deeper into the universe and detecting uh, fainter and fainter objects, um, many of the hot topics in astronomy now require um, ast astronomical instruments with much larger fields of view. So the communities that are looking for exoplanets that are trying to do time domain astrophysics, and importantly, the community that's trying to um, detect near Earth objects are all trying to achieve area coverage rate on the sky and designing telescopes with much bigger apertures than before. So some of the exoplanet work was pioneered by people like Don Polacco at uh, Warwick University, who realized that uh, you could, um, if you could monitor a large area of the sky and look at the brightness of stars on a regular basis, potentially then you could use the transit technique to see uh, the disks of uh, exoplanets moving across in front of their parent star. So uh, he built uh, this instrument uh, on La Palma and uh, demonstrated the ability to de detect exoplanets with this sort of instrument. And we're seeing similar sort of capabilities deployed elsewhere now um, with the idea of uh, trying to add to our currently uh, ever expanding uh, collection of exoplanets that we know about around other stars. Time domain astrophysics is uh, the desire to look at relatively short-lived transient events. We now have detectors with sufficient sensitivity that if we can detect short-lived events, we can slew a telescope onto them and try and collect um, detailed information about things like supernovas and gamma ray bursts. Uh, the challenge, though, is to monitor enough objects to actually catch one in the act, so to speak. So um, there are a variety of different transient events that astronomers are interested in. And by um, putting a large aperture on the sky and looking at uh, uh, a big area, you can pick up these events uh, starting to occur issue alerts, and then uh, more detailed, narrower field of view telescopes, the sort of traditional telescopes, if you like, uh, can then be brought to bear um, on these transient events. And then there's the issue of near-Earth objects. So um, having recognized the fact that uh, our existence is potentially imperiled in the way that the dinosaurs were, um, it has been decided that uh, we need telescopes such as the Rubin Telescope, uh, formerly known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, to provide very um, uh, wide area, um, rapid surveys of the sky, getting down to um, sufficient depth to detect uh, the types of um, objects that we are concerned about, which is objects on the order of 140 or 150 meters in diameter. So. Um, the aim is to use this telescope to um, survey the sky uh, every few days. 
And you can see that um, if this telescope is um, looking over very large areas of the sky continuously, it is in the future going to spot an awful lot of our satellites potentially reflecting light uh, into the telescope as well, uh, which is going to cause considerable confusion. So that is the genesis of the problem. So what can we potentially do about it? Um, I should just mention that it's not only the optical astronomers that are potentially inconvenienced by satellite operations. So the radio astronomers are also trying to develop more sensitive instruments, including um, uh, what is known as the square kilometre array. And one element of this is uh, an existing radio telescope in Australia called the Murchison Array. And uh, the Murchison Array has already been used in a kind of bi-static radar um, uh, configuration. Uh, they used an FM radio station in Australia as the source of transmissions. And then they um, watched the International Space Station fly over and actually picked up the echoes of the FM radio station bouncing off the International Space Station. Now, obviously, the International Space Station is very large, but um, the sensitivity of the square kilometre array is such that um, uh, it will, when it's configured, be able to detect really quite small pieces of debris. So unfortunately, from the point of the radio astronomers, it's not just the uh, satellites in orbit that are actually transmitting that cause them a problem. It's actually echoes of our terrestrial transmissions that are bouncing off objects in space as well. So um, the question that you have to ask is, is anywhere now radio quiet as well as dark? So the astronomical community has suggested some solutions and um, uh, I'll run through a few of these ideas just to illustrate the sort of impact that they would have on the satellite community. So um, there are ideas about making the satellites darker, about launching fewer satellites, uh, providing higher accuracy orbital data, etc. And um, uh, quite a lot of these um, ideas are either being trialed or um, have been demonstrated to have some potential utility. So let's just uh, uh, consider those for a moment. So to their great credit, Starlink um, recognized that they were um, creating an issue for the astronomical community and have actively attempted to do things to try and help. So one of the first things that they did was to um, uh, come up with a mission that they referred to, I think, as DarkSat. And what they chose to do there was to um, paint, I'm not sure if they actually painted, but they actually chose to darken um, the antennas on their satellites to try and reduce the amount of light that they were reflecting uh, back down to the Earth. Now, there's a reason why the original satellites um, antennas were white, and that is for thermal control. The idea is that um, uh, when you run the antennas, they'll potentially get hot, and if, you, if they're white in color, they will radiate and so won't overheat. And unfortunately, I think, because they haven't repeated the experiment, I think what Starlink discovered was that painting their antennas black um, just caused them to fail uh, prematurely. Undaunted, they tried a different technique. They tried incorporating uh, sort of uh, sun shields, visors on one of their missions with the idea that they would um, uh, stop the sunlight reaching uh, the antennas with the idea that they could uh, um, reflect less light. Um, again, not entirely clear that although that technique was tried, it actually led to the reduction in brightness that was desired. And they've also recognized that um, one of the issues that they have is that the satellites are in different orientations as they're raising their orbit from the one that they're in when they are deployed by the rocket up to their operational altitude. Uh, once they're in their operational altitude, they're in this so-called shark fin um, configuration. And 
uh, the brightness that they reflect down to the earth is um, uh, driven by the antennas on the bottom. But while they're orbit raising, um, the problem is that they can reflect an awful lot of light from their solar panels. Their um, proposed solution is to turn the solar panels edge onto the sun. Now, I'm reasonably confident that that will reduce their optical signature, but I'm not entirely clear how the satellite actually generates any power when its solar panels are edge onto the sun. So if anybody knows anybody from Starlink who can explain to me how that works, I'd be really interested to know. Ironically, uh, the most effective thing that Starlink may have done to uh, reduce its impact on the astronomical community um, is to uh, actually lower their altitude. Um, now that they're down at 550 kilometers, they will be um, in twilight conditions, which is where the satellite is illuminated, but the observation location um, on the ground is in darkness, the sun has set. And um, uh, by coming down to 550 kilometers, the amount of time that they will be um, uh, in twilight conditions is much reduced. So I borrowed these um, illustrations from a paper that was looking at the issue of um, interference to the Rubin telescope. And uh, um, there are different statistics depending on the time of year. So um, if you're an equinox, um, then uh, the time spent in um, twilight conditions is sort of averaged out and it's generally not as bad as the condition in local summertime where uh, potentially the satellites are um, illuminated by the sun for quite considerable periods. And in the case of um, satellites at the altitudes that OneWeb are planning to use, um, they uh, are visible throughout the night. As you can see in the bottom right, there are a, a, an appreciable number of satellites are visible all the time throughout the night, which is clearly going to cause quite considerable interference. So um, not only um, is OneWeb's um, constellation design not optimal from the point of view of um, providing coverage to um, the populated regions of the Earth, it's also not optimal from the point of view of interference to the astronomical community. Now, one of the ideas that the astronomers came up with would be that if the satellites uh, were providing um, precision space situation awareness information, i.e. very um, precisely defined orbits, um, they could potentially anticipate the satellite overflights and if not repoint the satellite, uh, the telescopes to avoid the satellites, they could at least know that the satellites would be passing through their field of view and take appropriate measures to either um, subtract the light delivered by the satellite or um, switch the detector off for a while as the satellite was passing through. Um, there are a variety of techniques that could be used to enhance the precision of space situation awareness. Some of them are illustrated on the, um, the screen here. And uh, it is actually the case that the, the data that the astronomers want to reject is actually the data that the space tracking community actually require to provide uh, better knowledge of satellite positions. But one of the points about this slide is that all of the techniques that are being applied to actually try and determine satellite orbits are um, doing space situation awareness to satellites, i.e. Their, their external sensors being used to track something which, in the case of ground-based sensors, are satellites orbiting several hundred kilometers away. And obviously that presents some quite interesting challenges in terms of accuracy and precision. So what might the space industry contribute that would actually start to make life a little easier? Well, a lot of satellites now carry um, GNSS receivers. They have the GPS uh, and other receivers on board, which allow them to determine their own position to a higher level accuracy than can be determined from the ground. And so, uh, that would certainly help to um, 
I uh, provide information about exactly when uh, satellites will be passing through the fields of view of telescopes. Another um, thing that satellites can potentially do is uh, collect thermospheric data. They can actually measure the drag that they're experiencing. And this might uh, turn out to be um, more important than we imagined. Um, if you were on the event last night, you'll know, you may have heard um, Hugh Lewis from Southampton talk about a rather um, worrying phenomenon that's been identified where it would appear um, possibly due to um, pollutants that we're putting in the atmosphere, that the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere are actually cooling and contracting and creating less drag for satellites. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, if that process is actually occurring, uh, the problem with space debris will increase because fewer of the objects will naturally deorbit due to drag. So there are quite a number of things that satellites can potentially do that will um, potentially provide um, uh, a much more accurate set of data that the astronomers can use to extract um, the satellite effects from their um, data collections. A couple of other ideas are to actually change the technologies that we use on satellites. So um, painting a satellite black permanently doesn't appear to work because it messes up the thermal control, but there are materials called electrochromic materials, which if you control um, the electrical charge on them, changes their, electric, uh, their um, optical properties. They can um, uh, be made to go black, essentially, um, depending on the amount of charge um, that they're holding. So it could be that um, satellites would be equipped with a database that would tell them where all the major telescopes were, and when they were in view of those telescopes, they could invoke um, a system like this to make themselves darker and then turn it off again um, when they're out of view of the telescopes so that they don't ruin their thermal control. Another change that we might see is for satellites to make even greater use of optical communications. Um, uh, there are some optical communications in use at the moment. Uh, the uh, European Union Sentinel satellites communicate their data back through the European Data Relay satellite using optical intersatellite links. At the moment, the EDRS satellites put that data back down to the Earth on a radio frequency link. And the reason for that is that uh, they are concerned about getting the data down in the presence of clouds. But um, if you were to have an extensive network of optical ground stations that you could talk to, you could probably um, find um, a network of optical ground stations that would allow you to have some of them not covered by cloud when you required it and move the data around um, using light. Um, the advantage of which is that you can modulate a lot more data onto an optical link than you can onto an RF link. And so potentially the data rates could even be increased. Um, so there is some potential, I think, for moving into the optical domain uh, which would obviously make life easier for the radio astronomers. And if you recall, uh, it's not just the active satellites that are a problem, it's the debris. So can we do something about debris removal? Well, there are a lot of concepts for debris removal. This is quite deliberately a very busy slide. Every time I hear about a new technique for debris removal, I find a picture of it and add it to this slide and make all the other pictures a little smaller. And it's to try and make the point that um, there are lots of ideas that have been proposed, but almost as soon as somebody suggests a technique for debris removal, somebody comes else comes along and explains why um, it wouldn't be appropriate to use that technique for certain types of debris. So we're almost certainly going to need a, a suite of debris removal techniques. Um, the um, engineering is quite hard, especially trying to grapple um, uh, non-cooperative, potentially tumbling objects. Um, the politics is quite hard because um, according to the current uh, space uh, treaties, um, nation states are responsible for the satellites that they launch and they remain um, 
the sovereign property of the nation that launches them. So if you go up and try and do, quote, salvage um, on uh, a piece of space debris, in theory, you're conducting some sort of um, crime in space by uh, violating a nation's sovereignty. And the final problem is the financial one that we face potentially here a tragedy of the commons. And uh, there are significant doubts about whether you can make a business case close for removing debris. Um, it's not like salvage at sea. Um, if you salvage something at sea, potentially you save the value of the ship, the value of its cargo and potentially the value of the cleanup operation that might have been required if it had actually gone on the rocks. Um, in the case of debris removal, at the moment, people are simply talking about deorbiting things into the Earth's atmosphere where they will burn up. So the satellite itself turns into atoms and there is no retrieved value. So not easy to see how you close a business case with that model. But there are bigger things at stake than simply making money and doing business in low Earth orbit. Uh, if you can't read the caption to the um, uh, cartoon of the two dinosaurs, one is them is saying to the other, all I'm saying is now is the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. So um, there are um, evidence or there is evidence uh, in the fossil record that um, Periodically, um, species on the Earth go extinct, and that appears to happen uh, every 26 million years. And that sort of regularity in probably implies some sort of astronomical cause. So um, are the right dinosaurs right to fear asteroids? Well, they might be, but there are other um, things like long-term cycles in the sun, supernovas, gamma ray bursts, comets, etc., that might also be responsible. Now, you might be thinking, well, none of those things, you know, sort of like impacts and stuff appear to have an obvious regularity. You would think that they might occur uh, randomly, but I'm going to um, suggest to you now that that might not actually be the case. So you may have come across the idea of the Goldilocks zone around the sun, which the Earth inhabits, which is where um, the temperatures are not too hot and not too cold, but just right for liquid water to exist on the Earth. Well, a similar sort of Goldilocks zone exists around the center of a galaxy. If you're too close to the center of a galaxy, potentially um, the uh, frequency of supernova explosions would probably sterilize your planet too quickly. And if you're out at the edge of this um, uh, spiral galaxy, uh, the density of supernovas is too low, so there are very few heavy elements generated and you just don't get enough heavy elements to build planets that involve water like the Earth. So you need to be in an orbit that takes on the order of 225 million years to, uh, to go around the centre of the galaxy like our sun. But um, the dynamics of the solar system, the Earth and the Sun, around the centre of the galaxy are not a simple orbit. Uh, it's more complicated than that. And that's the reason why you might see a degree of periodicity in the extinction events. So because of the mass of the galactic disk, uh, the Sun doesn't just go round and round the centre of the galaxy, it goes up and down at the same time. And our passages through um, the galactic disk are on the order of 25 to 35 million years apart, which given that we've got estimates of mass extinctions every 26, or 25 or 26 million years, um, does tend to start to make you think, well, maybe there is an astronomical source um, involved here. Now, I said uh, in the abstract that this was a presentation that concluded on a positive note, but I do have some positive news to report at this point, which is this currently is quite a long-term problem because uh, it will be on the order of 20 million years before we make another pass through uh, the plane of the galaxy. So if the increased density of stars there or the dust there causes effects that cause a mass extinction, 
at least we've got 20 million years to prepare for it. So let's assume that just for now, the near-term existential threat to life on Earth and to human beings, we need to take those quite seriously. Um, so we have quite a large population of near-Earth objects that we know about already, and we're discovering them quite fast. But um, we have a reasonable census of the large ones with, you know, diameters of a kilometer or more. But uh, we're still concerned about uh, relatively small objects, you know, maybe 150 meters across. And um, uh, the reason for that is that they have enough uh, kinetic energy to completely flatten uh, a major city uh, and potentially set up... Um, you know, sort of sufficient dust into the atmosphere that would affect um, uh, the growth of crops and things like that. So um, we do want to improve our census of those smaller objects because at the moment we've probably only got about um, a quarter of them uh, under custody. Uh, the reason we think we know these numbers uh, is thanks to a satellite called WISE. Um, which uh, was used um, to conduct a survey of the asteroid belt, and um, it used an infrared camera to do that. Why does the infrared work? Well, a lot of asteroids um, are relatively dark objects. Uh, they absorb a lot of the light that falls on them, but eventually that energy has to get re-irradiated, and it gets re-irradiated in the infrared. Um, so you have asteroids that are being heated by the sun against the cold background of space and uh, the signal to noise ratio is good so uh, a telescope likewise has the ability to provide um, a much better survey of the of the asteroid belt than uh, a, a telescope working in the optical there are a whole variety of potential techniques that we could use to prevent an impact. Some of them uh, are similar to the sort of techniques that we might use for debris removal. Um, some of them look a little bit um, sort of uh, trivial. Um, sort of, for example, the one that says paint, um, uh, clearly just painting the words go away on an asteroid won't cause it to go away. But if you do actually change the albedo of an asteroid sufficiently, solar radiation pressure can then act on the asteroid and actually change its orbit over time. So if you paint it white early enough, um, then the situation will improve. But we need to actually do a survey of these um, objects because they're not all the same. Some of them are almost solid lumps of iron. Some of them are loosely bound rubble piles, and some of them are somewhere in between. And to know which of these deflection techniques would work best, we need to do um, accurate uh, observations of them. So we need to provide our astronomers with um, the opportunity to actually conduct decent surveillance. Um, so we do need to preserve the skies for our astronomical community. If we look a bit further ahead, uh, potentially um, one of the things that the British Interplanetary Society has investigated quite a lot would be interstellar travel. And I'm going to suggest to you that if we wanted to plan a journey to another star, we would need to collect some quite exquisite information on the potential planetary system around that star. So you'd like to know things about the uh, the size and orbits of the planets, whether they have solid or gaseous surfaces, what they're made of, and importantly, whether they harbor life. So to do that, we're going to need better telescopes. And I would argue that uh, not only the sort of telescopes that we're familiar with down on the surface of the Earth, which operate through the atmospheric windows in the optical, the infrared, and the radio wavelengths, but a lot of the um, techniques for discovering whether they um, have life rely on spectral techniques, which might require us to observe a wavelengths which don't pass through the Earth's atmosphere very well. So uh, again, we might need space-based telescopes to actually derive the information that we need on other solar systems. 
we would obviously like to get bigger apertures to actually conduct those observations. We would like not just to detect the presence of exoplanets, but actually to get the sort of resolutions that would allow us to image them. Now, at the moment, we're developing very large ground-based telescopes. The ELT, which is illustrated in the lower left, is going to have a very large aperture. And um, uh, clearly, that sort of telescope is way, way too big to launch as a single um, uh, instrument into space at any feasible time in the future. But could we achieve the sort of capabilities of that telescope in orbit somehow. Well, there are technologies that the space manufacturing community are working on that could help. So uh, manufacturing, robotics, et cetera, on orbit uh, is increasingly being talked about and would potentially allow us to fabricate large structures without long risky spacewalks. And there are concepts that uh, don't try to do what the James Webb telescope is trying to do, which is to fold up the largest possible aperture into the launch envelope of a single rocket, but actually to compose um, uh, satellite instruments out of multiple, much smaller elements that can be reconfigured and bolted together to give different telescope performance. But uh, what we're assuming here is that the various sub elements of the telescope um, are actually joined together. That might work, uh, but we might find that in order to get the resolutions that we need, we actually need even bigger instruments where um, we're employing sparse aperture technology instead. I'll talk about that in just a moment, but I wanted to touch on where we're going potentially with the radio um, community. So one of the um, ideas that's been uh, resurrected recently is the idea of putting a, a radio telescope on the far side of the moon protected from uh, all the radio transmissions from the earth that I was talking about before. There are significant challenges in doing this. Lunar dust is evil stuff and would make the construction of this uh, radio telescope difficult. But if we were able to achieve it, it should have a nice quiet environment because um, it would be permanently looking away from the earth. Going back to the idea of sparse apertures, um, there have been concepts um, explored. Um, the one top right is uh, called Darwin and was an optical interferometer concept that was sort of put on hold because to make an uh, a phase based interferometer work, you need to know the baselines between the sub apertures um, accurate to a tenth of a wavelength. And obviously, if we're working uh, at optical wavelengths, that's a very short distance indeed, and our tele um, technology isn't currently up to delivering that sort of performance. But um, there are other interferometry techniques that um, have largely been um, sort of bypassed in recent years. So it turns out that the light from celestial objects is correlated in its intensity as well as its phase and in intensity interferometers have been developed. Uh, they've never been flown in space, but they might be an attractive candidate because um, in order to do intensity-based um, um, interferometry, you don't need to know the baselines between the elements quite so accurately. And there have been telescope concepts um, using sparse optical apertures proposed for the Earth. They're called hypertelescopes. And um, that concept has also been explored um, for deployment in space. So the idea would be to have uh, a huge array of mirrors um, uh, spread over 100 kilometers in diameter um, with the idea that uh, you could collect enough light um, to image um, exoplanets around uh, relatively nearby stars. But that would give you sufficient um, uh, resolution to differentiate between oceans, continents, and possibly if the things uh, exoplanet is uh, has life on it, vegetation zones too. But um, in order to get to that sort of technology, we are going to have to work even harder on precision orbital determination. These telescopes would need to be at a reasonable distance from the Earth because 
satellites in orbit around the Earth are subject to a whole load of perturbations that are very subtle, um, including Earth radiation pressure, which varies um, according to whether the satellite's orbiting over a dark ocean or a lighter colored continent or a clouded region. And the fact that we can already measure these sorts of perturbations on our GNSS uh, navigation satellites um, is an indication that to maintain the sort of uh, configuration of sparse aperture telescopes, we're going to need to take them a reasonable distance from the planet. Now, I'd like to change gear slightly here and introduce you to what I hope will be a new word for you. Um, I doubt that you'll find the word astrocracy in uh, a dictionary. Um, those who know me well will know I have a bit a particular enthusiasm for cryptic crosswords, and I have, as a result, a number of dictionaries. The word astrocracy doesn't appear in any of them, I checked. Um, but you will find this word on the internet, and what it is is a description of a society in which uh, the astronomers are in charge. Now, I'm going to argue that human societies have organized themselves on these lines in the past. Um, clearly, the people that built Stonehenge were able to corral an awfully large amount of effort and human resource to build an instrument that is clearly astronomically aligned. And if you're not convinced, uh, a little later in time, um, uh, People were making these sorts of artifacts. They're known as the Golden Hats of Europe. They've been found in various countries. Um, they are emblazoned with uh, carvings, and these carvings have been uh, interpreted as a sort of um, translation between solar calendars and lunar calendars. So the people that um, are wearing these things um, if indeed they were hats, um, are people with considerable astronomical knowledge. And clearly making sort of elaborate things like this out of gold, again, is um, taking up a lot of resource. So clearly the astronomers in the society are important people. Although I have to admit the description of hats leaves me slightly cold, especially when I look at the one on the left. Um, I'm not sure what sort of shaped head you would have to have in order to wear that one. So I wanted to finish by um, talking about the Fermi paradox, which, as you're probably aware, is um, the uh, suggestion by Enrico Fermi that uh, if it's the case that there are lots and lots of um, inhabited planets out there, uh, where is everybody? Why haven't we seen evidence uh, in radio transmissions um, or even been visited by aliens, um, because there's no convincing evidence that that has happened. Well, the reason that we think there are a lot of potentially inhabited planets out there is um, in part due to the equation that uh, Frank Drake derived, um, known as the Drake equation. The parameters that uh, are included in the Drake equation uh, are listed uh, on this slide. And we're starting to get um, a handle on th numbers for some of these. So the early ones, the number of stars in our galaxy, the number of those that have planetary systems, and the number of those planetary systems that include a planet in the Goldilocks zone, um, we're starting to get a handle on what those sort of statistics might be. Um, some of the later terms are still pretty uncertain. Uh, but even sort of reasonably conservative estimates in, tend to imply that we'll have a lot of um, uh, potentially inhabitable planets um, in our galaxy. Um, I'm a little more skeptical than that. Um, one of the things that I've been doing for a while now um, is to collect a list of um, what I call Drake issues, which are um, things that have been suggested um, were important in um, finding life on a planet, in particular the Earth, that are not represented um, in the Drake equation. So that concept that I mentioned just now um, of the Goldilocks zone around the center of a galaxy is not reflected uh, in the Drake equation. So. Um, the uh, the number of stars in the galaxy 
is not the right number. Um, it's the number of stars in the galaxy in the Goldilocks zone in the galaxy that would be potentially the right number to use. And as you can see, um, I've been doing this a little while, but there are quite a lot of um, uh, issues that I think makes um, the possibility of uh, inhabited planets rather less. So they may be a bit less, um, uh, you know, sort of common than we think. But I'd like to take you back to that issue um, that I mentioned about going sort of um, uh, interstellar. So ultimately, we know that we will need to leave the Earth because we know um, we understand uh, the physics of stars well enough to know that the sun will expand and that we will no longer be in our sun's habitable zone. Uh, the sun will expand, the Earth will get toasted, and if we haven't figured out somewhere else to live, um, we are going to die. So um, at that point, I think it's arguable that astronomer will certainly be the most important job on the planet. But I'd like to invite you to consider a thought experiment, which is that um, uh, we would need that exquisite knowledge of where to go um, and which direction to set off in, because it would be um, pretty depressing to head off towards a star and then find that either there were no suitable planets to land on or possibly even worse still that um, there was a decent planet but uh, some other life form had got there um, before us and that the planetary protection principle uh, suggests that we shouldn't land because um, it's an awfully long way to go to decide you ought to turn around and go home. So um, we're going to need some really exquisite telescopes to determine this sort of level of um, uh, detail. But going back to the Fermi paradox, perhaps other intelligent civilizations have already got to this point and have concluded that actually remote observation is one of the most important ways to explore the universe before you consider actually going off and trying to populate um, other planetary systems, you need to do really, really good surveillance of the skies um, first. And that um, if you want to survive, you need to allow your astronomers to prevent um, the existential threat from comets and asteroids wiping you out first. Um, and so it's conceivable that other intelligent civilizations have concluded that the idea of filling their skies with lots and lots of reflective satellites that are transmitting um, signals that annoy their radio astronomy is definitely not the right thing to do, and that they're actually conducting um, surveillance. And in order to do that surveillance well, they're quite deliberately being very, very quiet. So in conclusion, I hope that we can um, achieve some sort of uh, uh, accommodation between the uh, astronomical community and the satellite community because if we want to stay alive on the earth and protect ourselves from asteroids we're going to need better space-based telescopes. If we want to find life elsewhere we're going to need better space-based telescopes and if we want to find a new home in the galaxy eventually we're going to need better space-based telescopes. So we need that collaboration and to conclude I reckon astrocracy rules. Many thanks. Right, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Fascinating story. And really, I think we've got a lot to look for and to look out for in the next few years. Um, right, we've got a load of questions in, and please, if anyone's got any more questions, please get them in as soon as possible. I'm going to read out the questions and uh, ask Stuart to answer them to the best of his ability. Um, from what I've heard, he should be entirely capable. So let me just see, we've got three questions here so far, and top of the list, ah, oh, it's just moved. Top of the list is from Rich R. And he says, regarding the, the Starlink brightness issue, how do you feel about SpaceX statement in December 2019? No one thought of this. We didn't think of it. 
the astronomy community didn't think of it. And he's made a reference here. So we can all have a look at it, actually, at that statement. What do you say? Um, I think Starlink are probably stretching a point because I think some people were aware of some of the issues. Um, speaking personally, um, the uh the particular issue that i mentioned of the debris and its potential impact on the radio astronomy community um was definitely discussed long before starlink was even thought of and i know that because i was quite energetically trying to start a dialogue with the uh folks at jodrell bank who um have you know been sort of uh are coordinating the square kilometer array project because i was i heard the statement that um you know the square kilometer array would be sufficiently sensitive to detect lightning strikes on other planet on exoplanets and i thought with that level of sensitivity i'm absolutely sure they're going to see radio signals from the earth reflecting off the stuff that we've got in orbit already so I think there were some there was some dialogue going on. I think probably the thing that's taken Starlink by surprise is how many members of the general public have suddenly gone, oh look, there's stuff flying over our head that perhaps they hadn't noticed before. But I think the astronomy community was aware. Right. Well, I think there are a few people up in arms, including the people I uh, met in NASA uh was it 2019 they were all have a meeting there to find out what starlink was going to do um right we've got another question then and this is from sam Ayer, who says if we have more satellite launches won't it open up the market for more space-based observatories and allow us to conduct more scientific research plus launch vehicles like starship will allow us to build more powerful telescopes which would be more effective? I think that's actually a sort of uh, a restatement of some of the things that were in the talk. I would draw a distinction, though, that um, uh, the majority of the launches that are happening at the moment, like Starlinks, are for commercial purposes, and they're focused on providing services back down to the Earth, whereas the sort of uh, astronomical instruments that is referred to in the question are um, generally done by um, either nation states or collaborations of nation states um, so they're sort of governmental rather than profit making missions and they are obviously trying to look out uh, i think my point is that um, if the um, if the astronomy community, um, and that does in response to one of the points in the in the chat, include astrophysicists and cosmologists. I'm just using astronomers as a shorthand here. Um, if that community can make a convincing case that, um, it, well, in order to avoid all this interference, you're going to have to build us some really cunning space-based telescopes, um, that uh, the satellite manufacturing community may well be able to turn their talents to actually doing that and in doing so potentially you get um, larger apertures and access to uh, frequencies and wavelengths that don't go through the atmosphere so we'll actually be able to do a better job of astronomy from um, space in than we can from the surface of the earth so actually um, going into space is a win-win situation i think Mm. Right. Well, let's hope it all goes goes ahead as planned then. Um, thank you. Now, we've got one here from uh, Dean Sherman, who says, how can, how can we clean up the debris in Leo so it doesn't get out of hand in the future? Yes. Yeah, so I included a page of um, debris removal technologies, and there are lots of suggestions. But I, um, what I think I'll do is, is share the possible solution to the most difficult of the problems. And I think the most difficult of the problems is the financial one, that nobody really wants to pay for the cost of the cleanup operations. So the question is, how do you raise um, enough money to um, conduct the debris removal? And there are particular target objects like 
large rocket bodies that we think we need to get out of orbit because they are, if they were to collide, they would be a large reservoir of, of further debris up fragments. So um, I've heard it suggested that you might place a levy on launches to raise a fund that would be used to pay for debris removal. But I think that's unlikely to find favor. And the reason is this transition from governmental space to commercial space. So if you were to start putting a levy on commercial operators, they would say, um, look, it's hard enough to close the business case on our constellation in the first place. Um, and uh, if you make it any more expensive, we just won't be able to afford to launch. Oh, and by the way, we didn't create the problem. It was the national governments doing large national space missions that created the problem in the first place. So my suggestion in the, um, if I'm allowed a very quick plug, I wrote a book on some of this uh, entitled Space Traffic Control, which was published about four years ago now. In the final chapter, you'll find a suggestion, which is the following. Um, in the space treaties, it says that um, we shouldn't go out into space and appropriate celestial bodies. So we can't go to Mars, for example, stick our national flag on Mars and say it belongs to our country. Um, and I think that principle is absolutely fine for planets and maybe a lot of the larger named asteroids. That's fine. But just suppose we said that um, we decided that the smaller asteroids were, were fair game and that initially we would um, uh, allocate ownership of all the smaller asteroids to a United Nations entity. So they would still be kind of owned by all mankind, but now they would be owned. And then we gave that United Nations um, entity the right to uh, assign naming rights to people uh, or mineral exploitation rights to people and actually create a market in asteroids. Now, I think there are enough billionaires on the planet that would like to have their name on an asteroid in perpetuity. So I think there's a chance of the United Nations entity selling asteroids. And a phrase you've probably not heard before, but you might one day hear is um, the phrase, my asteroid's bigger than your asteroid, because I think there would be um, a, a premium for the bigger ones. Um, and as a result, I think you could um, bring a lot of money into um, that United Nations entity, which would then also be charged with uh, funding uh, the cleanup operation for um, low Earth orbit, and also the potential deflection of near Earth asteroids that we spotted that were coming our way. Mm, interesting. Sounds as if we should get Bitcoin invo involved here. Um, right. <laughs> Uh, right, we've got one here from Robert Law, who says, is this a fad in technology that after a period of time will become obsolete? Um, it's possible. I certainly don't think that there is enough market out there to support all of the 100,000 um, satellites that is the figure that you get if you add up all the proposed constellations. I don't think that there is enough business to keep all of those satellites flying. But I do think there is potentially enough business out there to keep quite large numbers of satellites flying. And so I still think we have an issue to address. And even if it's not just the active satellites, as I tried to make the point, there's already a lot of um, debris up there that would be of concern, and we still need to address that problem anyway. So um, whilst I think huge, huge numbers of mega constellations probably are a fad, a smaller number of mega constellations and the debris is not a fad, it's just a fact. And we're going to have to um, find a way of working that so that we don't compromise the astronomical community. Mm, yes, interesting. We have uh, difficult times ahead of us. Uh, right, the next one is from Les Shoulder, and he says, what is the orbit, or asks, what is the in-orbit lifespan of a Starlink-class satellite, and will it be like painting the fourth rail bridge once the swarm is complete, however many that is? More launches yeah. will be required, 
just to replace the number falling out of the sky? Yes, so it's a perceptive question, um, but the idea is that um, all the mega constellation operators, we hope, will be required by their national licensing authorities to comply with the uh, get your satellites out of orbit within 25 years. So uh, in theory, um, the lifetimes, which I think for Starlinks are typically five to seven years, um, it, it, eventually you get a stable population where the constellation is uh, at its maximum population and satellites are being launched as fast as they're dropping out of the sky. Um, it is worth noting, though, that um, at the moment, uh, when there's a sort of significant re-entry event like that uh, Chinese rocket body that made the press recently, uh, it seems to get some attention. Um, uh, at the rate that Starlink are launching, in about five to seven years, they're going to start um, being deorbited at a similar rate. And so we're going to be looking at needing to track um, you know, sort of several re-entering satellites per day. I think I estimated it at three per day um, a little while ago, um, depending on how big the mega constellation population actually ends up being. But you could be looking at trying to make sure that lots and lots of satellites are um, deorbiting properly and, and, you know, targeting oceans rather than um, re-entering overland areas in case um, I mean, most satellites will burn up, but there are quite a lot of cases of things like um, tanks and things that hold propellant actually making it down to the ground. Um, so ideally, we'd like them to be deliberately deorbiting uh, into oceans rather than just um, uh, deorbiting randomly and potentially landing on populated areas. Yes, and I should think there's a problem with some of the uh, equipment that's actually in a lower Earth orbit than those because they'll be um, having to avoid all sorts of uh, bits of debris and things falling out of the sky. There's quite a lot of concern already about, um, you know, for example, the International Space Station. I think I saw an estimate that said it's making a manoeuvre to avoid a tracked piece of debris every six months or so, which, you know, at the moment, that's that's not great. But if the if the flux of descending objects gets bigger, then obviously they're going to spend quite a lot of time um, wasting propellant just getting out of the way of other things. Yes, when launching from Canaveral, the only thing we had to worry about was whether we were actually going to miss the uh, International Space Station. Now, of course, you've got thousands of other things up there to have to miss out on. So it does narrow your window rather significantly. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, right. Well, at least it's cheaper than it was. When I was first doing launches from Canaveral, it cost me $10,000 an hour to transmit the launch video back to the UK. So every time they delayed it by an hour, it cost me another $10,000. Right. Um, Will Global, this is from Griffin, Griffin Ingram. It's, he says, will global warming increase drag on satellites? Uh, good evening, Griff. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, uh, it could do, but as I mentioned in the talk, um, uh, if we, I mean, if the atmosphere were to increase um, significantly uh, in temperature and that increase in temperature extended all the way up to uh, the top of the atmosphere, which is obviously what leads to drag on satellites, then the answer would be yes. But um, the latest evidence, um, and I would refer you to the works of Hugh Lewis uh, at Southampton University uh, for a much better exposition of this idea, is that the latest measurements seem to indicate that for reasons possibly related to um, sort of uh, instabilities that man-made activity might have caused in the upper atmosphere, the upper atmosphere is currently on a cooling trend and is actually sort of crunching in around the planet more than it used to. So the, the drag that satellites and debris are experiencing is actually reducing rather than going up. Right. Well, thank you for that. We shall um, look forward to global warming now. Um, <laughs> right. In t this is from uh, Nina Kojima. 
who says in 2009, non-functional Russian satellite collided with French satellite. Russian officials were saying that it's not their fault because the satellite was not functional and they had no power to prevent this. Can we see more of these cases where countries will take no responsibility? Do we need a space ethics or just more sophisticated space laws? Uh, we probably need both. Um, and uh, just a slight finesse on the question, it was actually um, an operational Iridium 33 satellite from the United States uh, that collided with the defunct Russian Cosmos 2251 that caused um, quite a significant increase in the debris population. I think they've tracked more than 3,000 objects from that collision now, which is um, quite a serious, um, you know, sort of event. Um, so you've actually mentioned one of my sort of favorite questions that I use to tease the space lawyers. Um, so if you ever meet a space lawyer, here's how to tease them, okay? Um, the question you need to ask them is, who was responsible for that collision? So there's at least two lines of argument. One line of argument says that the Russian satellite was defunct. It had been left in orbit. It was litter, if you like. And um, uh, terrestrially, if people go around littering and it causes a problem, uh, we have this principle that we say polluter pays, you know, so uh, maybe the Russians are liable and they should pay up for the um, the damage caused. The other argument says that, well, the Russian satellite was launched first, uh, it had completed its mission, it was indeed defunct, as the question uh, implied. The Iridium satellite was launched later, it had done a number of maneuvers, and it was one of those maneuvers that finally put... Um, the two spacecraft on collision course. So um, metaphorically, the Iridium satellite stepped out in front of a bus and got hit. So it was clearly the Iridium satellite's fault and um, they, so they should be held liable. So what the legal community um, uh, tries to establish is a, a thing called fault. Um, and arguably, um, in this case, both sides were at fault to some degree. My personal opinion, although I'm not a space lawyer, I would hasten to add, is that I think the Iridium satellite was more at fault than the Russians. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, they had information um, that told them that their satellite was potentially going to make a reasonably close pass to this Russian satellite, and they chose not to act. They chose not to maneuver. They metaphorically crossed their fingers and hoped that they would miss. And that strategy, obviously, on that day in 2009 didn't work. Um, but um, you're quite right to suggest that we need um, uh, a much tighter legal regime. And if you know, if you'll forgive me, that's what quite a lot of what my book Space Traffic Control is about. It basically makes the case that, you know, um, if you go back in history, aircraft flew around and, um, you know, sort of could do what they liked for a while. And then it was realized that, you know, this wasn't a good idea. Accidents were happening and air traffic control came into existence. And I think we've been in the same sort of initial regime with space for a while, and now we're realizing that with lots and lots of satellites up there whizzing past one another, we need to implement the, uh, the space equivalent of air traffic control. Right, so that's um, going to be a military activity, do you think? Well, I think the military find it quite hard to share their data. Um, there are a number of very capable military radars that are used to provide a lot of the data that goes into the catalogs that we have at the moment, but the data is averaged um, and is less accurate than we might like, and that is done deliberately to avoid revealing the true capabilities of the radars. Um, now we're seeing commercial uh, companies like um, Leo Labs are building radars to track stuff in low Earth orbit, and there's a company called ExoAnalytic, and there are others um, that are doing telescopes to track satellites further away in geostationary orbit. And uh, so 
uh, tracking of space objects is starting to become a commercial um, enterprise, and I think that process will continue. And I wish the companies doing it every success because I think it's exactly what we need. And do you think insurance companies will buy into this so that they can get the information and be as assisted? Yeah, so I think they will be very interested in the data so that they can set realistic premiums. I remember uh, having a, a very enlightening conversation with um, a gentleman called David Wade, um, who is one of the space insurers that Alistair probably knows. Um, and uh, David said to me, well, Stuart, we, we don't think that we want to take away the risk entirely because if you take away the risk entirely, the insurance business goes out of business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but he said we would be interested in having better statistics so that we could in, um, calculate our insurance premiums with greater certainty. Yeah, it's the sort of business that Seradata are in. So um, I hope someone from Seradata is listening in on this. Um, mm -hmm. Right, I better get on with it because I've got a... a yeah, a question from Alex Wood here. He says, oh, hi, you, men you mentioned what Starlink has done to reduce their impact on astronomy. What about other constellations? Yeah, really good question, because I, I held up Starlink as a shining example, because as far as I know, so far, they are the only one to actually do anything practical. I am encouraged that... Uh, People associated with the OneWeb program are on record as saying that they want to be, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, conduct good practice and and um, avoid um, causing interference to people's enjoyment of the skies. But I haven't seen anything yet that would constitute a practical step in that direction from any of the others, OneWeb or or Kuiper. I mean, it it. As I mentioned, you know, rather ironically, although I don't think they did it to improve the situation for astronomers, the best thing that Starlink did was lower their orbit altitude. I mean, it is conceivable, I think, that um, a legitimate response to uh, from OneWeb would be to say, well, you know what, 1,200 kilometers, uh, we're, we're in the sunlight a lot of the time we're going to reduce our orbital altitude too. Um, but so far, I haven't seen them making statements like that. As far as I know, they're still planning to launch, you know, lots and lots of satellites to 1,200 kilometres altitude. And I think the astronomical community are right, rightly quite worried about that. Yes, I see in the chat line here, John Davis is saying, uh, well, actually Fabrizio, I think, is, is asking the question about the effect on radio astronomy being almost as yeah. great, possibly greater than the effect on uh, physical observing. Yeah, I think that could be true. As I say, I, uh, I attempted to start a dialogue with the radio astronomy on a couple of occasions um, going back at least 10 years and, and didn't manage to get beyond first base, really. Um, you know, I got... Um, an email address, I sent an email, um, I got a polite acknowledgement, and then everything went very quiet. I don't know whether there was a concern at the time that they were still trying to get the money for the square kilometer array, and if some idiot like me came along and said, but won't you see an awful lot of reflected signals off of satellites and uh, see a lot of transmissions from satellites that will make it very hard to do your observations, that they might have found it harder to get the funding, I don't know. But now that they are, I think, progressing, I think they definitely need to um, engage with the satellite community because um, I think, well, and even the, rate, the terrestrial radio community, because I think there is considerable potential given the sensitivity of the square kilometre array that they're going to be able to pick up signals that were previously down in the noise uh, for other radio telescopes. And they're actually going to have to um, avoid mistaking terrestrial signals for stuff coming from, from space to a much greater extent than, the, than any previous radio telescope. Mm. I think that's what NASA were talking about in 2019 when I was trying to get hold of them. Um, right, I've got another question here. Actually, Alan Marlow thinks it's already been asked, but he 
the actual life of a Starlink satellite? I think you've actually mentioned it. Yeah, I, well, I think Starlink um, typically talks about five to seven years. But, you know, the point that was also made in one of the earlier questions is that um, the aim is to provide um, a continuous service. So they're not just going to launch one batch of satellites, leave them up there for five to seven years, deorbit them all and the problem goes away. Um, the aim is to launch them have them operate for five to seven years and then replace them with other satellites when they deorbit the ones that are at the end of their life. So it gets to potentially a stable situation where the constellation is fully populated. And in the case of Starlink, they are talking about many thousands of satellites in their final constellation. Um, so, you know, the skies could be very busy indeed um, if they actually launch the number that they've actually filed with um, for the with the FCC in the states. Mm. Right, thank you. Right, I've got one from Dean Sherman, and he's saying interstellar travel is a fascinating concept. Do you think we will ever achieve it? I'm aware of the feasibility studies that the BIS have and are currently undertaking. Yeah. Well, obviously, I'm not a paid up member of the um, I4IS, uh, the Institute for Interplanetary. Uh, interstellar studies um and there is a reason for that i i don't um for a moment question their imagination and their enthusiasm but i think i want to um try in my career to address things that are going to happen in my lifetime um and uh so i think we're a long long way from being able to achieve that you know we're struggling to get to the edge of the solar system at the moment let alone get to a nearby star but I think there are certain questions which I alluded to in my thought experiment slide towards the end of my presentation that I think you have to take quite seriously, you know, sort of, do we have enough information about our potential destination to know whether we'd want to set off in the first place? Because, you know, realistically, um, you can design a space vehicle that might allow you to spend a very long time i don't know whether it's a thousand or ten thousand years traveling to to another star but you know there there are some very long long time scales that have been suggested um what you would i think be wanting to be pretty confident about if you were going to try and set out on such a mission is that when you actually arrived you had a sporting chance of doing something so you know sporting chance of survival and that implies, you know, finding a planet that, you know, has a suitable gravity that, and a suitable atmosphere that you could enter and land on, that you could find the resources that you might need to keep you alive. I'm thinking water is probably the top of that list. Um, but also, you know, not arriving and then suddenly going, oh, well, we thought we were coming to this planet that was just, you know, um, oceans and a bit of land that we could touch down on and now we've suddenly discovered that there's an alien species swimming around in the ocean and we will probably compromise it if we land well what do you do then you know i mean so i think my argument i think is not that we shouldn't do interstellar travel i think we're going to have to one day as i pointed out at the end but i think we need much better intelligence before we embark on the journey Hmm. Yeah, I'm um, not sure I'll be around to do it, but we'll wait and see. Uh, right, I've got one actually. Fabrizio has asked a question here. And oh, hi, Fabrizio. He says, since you touched on the subject, is it really useful to launch stuff and land it on the moon to build a radio telescope instead of just building a radio telescope with a much greater baseline in space? The one on the moon yeah. would have severely limited targeting capability. The one in space most likely will not even need astronauts. P.S. Shielding effect can be achieved by a sufficiently larger separation from the Earth. See Lisa Parthine, for instance. Yeah, he's got yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, Fabrizio, I don't know if you've come across a concept that was proposed, I think, to ESA um, a while back. Uh, it was um, abbreviated S-U-R-O, SURO. I'm afraid I can't, I think it's an acronym, but I can't remember what the, the letters stood for at the moment. But it was a, a low frequency radio telescope that was indeed 
designed to be a sort of free-flying, low-frequency radio telescope um, that had a, a sort of mothership and then uh, an array of uh, deployed uh, nano satellites uh, providing the sort of sparse aperture around it. And I think you're quite right to suggest that that sort of concept does have a lot to commend it. I mentioned the um, the lunar crater concept um, because as I was preparing the talk, I saw it had appeared, you know, in the press again and was being discussed again. Um, and I thought, well, since it's topical, I'll put it in. But I tend to share your view. And if you have a look at my um, final slide, I, I did say, you know, sort of we need a lot more space-based telescopes. And I, I agree with you that I think, you know, sort of going out to L2 and, and places like that is is the way to do it because you get away from the um, interference that being too close to the Earth or indeed uh, too close to the moon would actually cause. Mm, thank you. I see in the chat line that Nina has done some research on it. And this is going back to the lifetime of, of uh, Starlinks four to five years, and they must be deorbited, I think. Is that right? Uh, I believe that the FCC have made that a condition of their license. Well, it's interesting. It'll probably be about five years then if our estimate, um, the numbers, uh, our ranges sort of overlap at five years. So I guess that's, um, <laughs> let's go for that as a number. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Right. Um, you can understand why um, the business case uh uh is much better financially if you can make the satellites last that extra couple of years you're you're having to replace um the satellites far less frequently and so it saves you a lot of money if you can make the individual satellites last a bit longer mm. yeah okay um right i've got one from uh, Tarek uh, abu hashem who says, is there any development needed concerning space mitigation guidelines of international space law based on the current situation in space around our planet ship Earth? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's increasingly being recognized. Um, there was, uh, as Alistair mentioned in the introduction, the G7 um, made a commitment to improved uh, sustainability in space. Uh, during their recent discussions. And I think that's a recognition of a lot of debate that's been taking place that says, you know what, the, the existing space law was largely developed between, I think, 1967 was the Outer Space Treaty, and then there were a series of other treaties um, that were signed in the early 1970s. But at that time, nearly all of space activity was being done by nation states rather than commercial operators and it's been very apparent just recently that um you know sort of that sort of regime just isn't sophisticated enough to deal with the issues um as an example i didn't mention it in the talk but um uh just recently there was a potential conjunction between a one web satellite that was in a parking orbit and hadn't yet boosted up to 1200 kilometers and one of the Starlink constellations. So a warning message was issued to both companies. And then there was some sort of Mexican standoff between the two companies. And they ended up, you know, slinging verbal insults at one another across the internet about who tried to contact who, who didn't pick up the phone, who didn't do whatever, you know, and, um, it, you know, that was just the first example of what are going to be many, many conjunctions between active constellation satellites. And if the two companies, you know, are end, going to end up insulting each other rather than phoning each other and sorting the problem, we're going to end up with more debris collisions like was mentioned in one of the earlier questions. We are going to need much better... Uh, guidelines and I one of the reasons why I call my book space traffic control as opposed to space traffic management is that I personally make the following distinction space traffic management is a set of voluntary guidelines which people adopt to try and make things better space traffic control is where there are actual international laws that tell you what you have to do and there are penalties if you don't 
And I think the history of air traffic demonstrates that the former might be a stepping stone, but it doesn't work in the long term. And ultimately, you need regulations. I mean, if you I mean, just imagine the situation if an aircraft operator said, I'm going to build an aircraft. Uh, I'm not going to put any collision avoidance measures on it. I'm not going to have any radios on it. I'm not going to have a navigation system. I don't care. Um, and I'm just going to fly around. Um, nobody would let them enter their airspace. Now, you know, space isn't nationally owned, but I think we should get to the point where we would say, you know, people that launch um, satellites that don't have the ability to work out their own position, communicate their position, uh, et cetera, are just, you know, imperiling everybody else that's up there and they shouldn't be allowed to launch. You've You've got to take responsibility for maintaining the environment. Mm, yes, and to think I was going to become an air traffic controller if I hadn't <laughs> actually um, become a, an Airbus wing designer instead. Uh, I think I took the right route. Um, so don't have me on board as a space traffic controller. It sounds like hell. Uh, right. <laughs> so Fabrizio's asked again. He says, so you agree that L2 is becoming, yeah, L2 is becoming the next highest mountain? Or I think it longer. could well be. Um, obviously, the satellites that go out to L2 are sort of approximately at L2. Um, I think they tend to perform um, sort of orbits around the L2 location to avoid the issue that um, in order to talk back to the Earth, uh, you're essentially looking in the direction of the sun, which isn't necessarily um, the ideal thing for doing effective radio communications. Um, so I think, you know, there, but there's quite a lot of space, quote, around L2 in the vicinity of L2 to put quite a lot of um, quite sophisticated space telescopes. Right. I have another question here from Rich R. Oh, Drake equation. Right. I don't recall if you had this one as one of your additional Drake factors, but one factor could be the actual willingness of a civilization to transmit a relatively obvious signal. From the maths, I've toyed with it. Sorry, from the maths I've toyed with, it seems that you really need an Arecibo Eric, Eric, size antenna fit, fed significantly. Arecibo. Arecibo is that. Uh, fed significantly, nearly indefinitely. That might narrow yeah. up the Drake L term greatly, given at least our own earthly behavior. Yeah, I. I would agree with that assessment, but I think the point that I was trying to close on in my penultimate slide is that the willingness is actually a factor of what that particular uh, civilization is seeking to do. And if that civilization is actually trying to protect itself from rogue asteroids and, and stuff, they might be quite deliberately being... Um, as quiet as they can so that their astronomers can do the best possible job of protecting them against, you know, sort of rogue impactors. So the willingness could indeed be that, you know, well, we've thought about it and we've decided that blasting radio waves into our environment around our planet is not the thing to do because we could actually mask the signature of something that we would really, really want to know about, which is, you know, a comet heading our way. Hmm. Yes, right. We've got uh, squeezed in another couple. I, I've got time to actually get through them. So, Alex Wood, what lessons are there for the proposed lunar constellation Moonlight? How should deorbiting be handled? Oh, now that's a really good question. And um, uh, one of the things that... Um, uh, has been done in the past, actually, was quite deliberately deorbit uh, things on the moon to actually create impacts that could be used for seismometry. Um, so um, it's possible that um, you could actually do a science experiment with the deorbiting of things onto the moon um, to actually create bangs that could be picked up by a seismometer network and tell you about the interior of the moon. Um, but there is this issue of, you know, sort of not wishing to um, pollute the environment. Um, 
I wonder whether ultimately, you know, just leaving junk on the surface of other celestial bodies uh, might start to be frowned on just as much as we don't like leaving junk um, lying around on the earth. Um, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> right. Well, I think I've got a couple more here. Just let's quickly go through them before I uh, have to wrap up. Um, right. This is from Griff again. Griff says, what are the prospects for a virtual orrery to predict satellite collisions? And Rich R says he wants one on, on his desk. Right. So uh, we sort of have that already in that um, there are uh, software programs that take the orbital elements for all the stuff that we currently track, which is between 20 and 30,000 objects, and feeds them into a conjunction prediction uh, program. And when things come reasonably high probability of collision, uh, they the program will issue a warning. At the moment, I think the threshold that's usually used is um, uh, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So either 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 10,000, I think, is typically the threshold that's invoked. Although they do calculate, you know, smaller probabilities. Um, but uh, there are uh, conjunction warning messages um, issued via, you know, sort of space command in the States, and they are then picked up by other organizations around the planet and then um, refined um, analyses are done. The difficulty is that there are uncertainties um, associated with the orbits um, and things like drag currently limits our ability to predict satellite orbits with the orrery type program more than about three days into the future because the drag is too uncertain at that point. So we need to get better measurements um, and actually start forecasting space weather rather than just measuring it so that we can um, actually extrapolate. It's a bit like weather forecasting. You know, once upon a time, you got a weather forecast for tomorrow and it was iffy whether it would be right or not. Nowadays, the forecasts for tomorrow are really good and their predictions out for about a week aren't too bad. We need to get to that sort of position with our um, uh, space projections. At the moment, our predictions for tomorrow, quite good. Two or three days out, mm, getting pretty ropey. Any longer than that, probably not usable. We need to get more warning time so that people can refine the measurements, work out whether it really is a close conjunction, and then take steps to maneuver if necessary. Mm. Right. Well, we got another couple of questions slipped in. Steve Salmon says, as per Alex's question, we would need controls as to the locations of lunar impacts, for instance, to protect the Apollo landing sites. That's right up your speed. Yeah, absolutely. So there's... Uh, an organization, I think it's called For All Moonkind, that is quite actively lobbying to uh, protect uh, the lunar landing sites. Um, I think they started off with the idea that there might be uh, commercial tourist missions to go and, for example, land alongside the Apollo 11 um, landing site so that people could, you know, kind of see what uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin saw. And I think they were concerned that trophy hunters might start, you know, picking up things and taking them home. Um, but I agree with Steve that, you know, it would be really ironic and terribly bad luck if you were to deorbit something onto the moon and, and destroyed, um, you know, some important artifact. Mm, yes, yes, I'll be more careful when I visit Stonehenge then. Um, right, back to Leo. Re-entry re fireballs will potentially disrupt astronomers both visible and radio. This is John Kimberley. Yes, um, although statistically um, you'd get more unlucky. Um, that This is a bit more like, um, you know, I mean, astronomers have always had to um, potentially contend with um, uh, uh, natural meteorite streaks across um, their images. And, you know, there are quite a lot of examples of that if you look on the internet. Um, our re-entering satellites will potentially contribute to that, but as a proportion of the number 
of things coming in, I think it would remain quite small. There are, we think, you know, sort of thousands and thousands of natural objects hitting the earth every day. And the number of man-made um, objects that would uh, burn up fast enough and get bright enough to um, to be visible, I think, would be relatively small. The reason it makes a difference, so the re-entry velocity, is, is because of the energy. Um, the micro particles are coming in at the speed of comets, so that can get up to as much as 70 kilometers a second, whereas Earth orbiting objects are going only a tenth of that. So you have to be a bigger object to um, dis you know, um, have enough kinetic energy to get bright enough to be um, a problem, I think, with most man-made uh, object re-entries. Mm, right. I think we're going to have to end as soon as we can because apparently it's now raining on the Essex-London uh, border, according to Les, and the lightning is due any moment. And I've left my right. sun blinds out, so... I okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the problems of the the uh, online type lectures. Um, well, thank you, Stuart. That was a fascinating talk, and so many amazing facts and figures. And thank you also for answering so many of the questions. Um, and a big thank you to Elizabeth for once again coordinating the evening behind the scenes. If you've enjoyed yeah. tonight's talk and want to make a donation, please click on the donate button. As I said earlier, every little helps to cover our costs. I'm afraid we've all been concentrating on getting the Reinventing Space Conference on uh, 28th to 30th of June up and running. So I'm pleased that Stuart stepped in tonight. I do hope some of you enjoyed the 41st China-Russian Technical Forum on Saturday the 5th of June. Because we had a technical problem with Gerber Singh's presentation on Saturday, we have squeezed in his talk on Israel under lockdown, how India's space activities have been impacted by the pandemic in two days time. So on Friday, the 18th of June at 1800, 6 p.m., uh, I hope many of you will be able to join us to listen to his talk again. Steve Salmon, who looks after our branches, is running a BIS branch launch event on Saturday the 19th of June at 10.30 uh, in the morning. So you'll have to be up early for that one. So I hope some of you will join in that. It could be a fascinating talk. And if you want to start a branch, this is how to do it. Um, I hope to see some of you at the QE2 Conference Center uh, on the 28th, 30th of June. As I said earlier, we are going ahead and the full program is now available on our BIS.com uh, website. So um, we'll be presenting the Sir Arthur Clarke Awards at the conference dinner on the 29th, which is going ahead. All of it is socially distanced. And uh, so we are limited to 116 people. Um, I'm pleased to say that we had 166 nominations for 82 nominees. A big thank you to all those who participated and to the 60 plus judges who have now selected the three finalists and now selected also the uh, the winners. Now you won't find out who the winners are, but the announcement for the finalists has been issued yesterday and today. So please look in and you will get that from the website. The finalists will not be announced until that dinner on the 29th of June. And we're very pleased to say we got the highest turnout of finalists ever with 24 of the 28 finalists, all we hope. We've all accepted, and we hope they're all going to turn up. I shall certainly be there fully marked up. I hope you've all got yours. Um, so uh, on the 14th of July, we're returning to ESA to hear all about the ExoMars rover, Rosalind Franklin, the complete program from the man in charge, Luc Joudrier, who is the operations manager at ESA. This is a follow-on talk from Paolo Ferry's talk on ESA space operations and the future ExoMars flight director's talk that was um, uh, Tiago uh, Lurero, and he was talking on the ExoMars cruise entry and descent and landing system. So I think we've got a lot to look forward to, and I think we're also going to see another talk on uh, the West Midlands branch on the 31st of July 
Additive Manufacture of Combustion Chambers by Amelia Stanton. And finally, on the 11th of August, Duncan Lunan, some of you will from, from Scotland recognize the name. He's in Glasgow and he's offered to talk about his book, Incoming Asteroids. What could we do about it? We hope to advertise it soon. So in all, we have a busy summer ahead of us. Look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you again for an excellent talk tonight. And we'll look forward to having you again in the future to tell us what the results of all this, um, uh, all these th uh, thoughts and ideas are. So good night to all and thank you very much for participating. We had, um, I reckon, 92 people joining us today from as far apart as Iceland, Germany, Rome, Egypt, Luxembourg, Cornwall, West Sus Sussex, Surrey, Norfolk, Pennycook, and uh, that was near where I was educated, Dundee, near where my family came from, Bath, South Europe, and Milton Keynes. Well, that huge South Europe is, is Rome again, Fabrizio. So thank you all for joining us and have, well, hope to see you all on Friday. Thank you very much. Good okay, night. Thank you, and thank you, Elizabeth, for running it for us.